listeners, we will get to introductions, but but first, but first, I am sitting here with Todd Pease of JLL. Todd, tell us something that you believe about the office asset class that might surprise us. Well, according to the latest uh, JLL research, uh, that are Fortune 100 office attendance policies uh, that have been surveyed. 3.08 days is the average weekly attendance requirement for Fortune 100 employers. Thought that was interesting. Todd, listeners, welcome to the source of commercial real estate where we talk to the experts in non residential commercial real estate so you can grow your business, find a competitive advantage, and use real estate to live the life that you want. I am your host. Jonathan Hayek, I'm a former public school teacher who found financial freedom through residential real estate investing, and now I am investing in larger commercial deals, particularly small industrial properties. And today I am talking with Todd Pease. Todd serves as the Cincinnati, Ohio market lead for JLL's Agency Leasing Council. Todd has 23 years of experience in the greater Cincinnati real estate market, including the greater Dayton area and the state of Kentucky. Todd brings a unique skill set to the table for his clients, which includes landlord representation, tenant buyer representation, project leasing, con construction estimating, budget creation, acquisitions and dispositions, development services, sale leaseback trans transactions, and overall real estate portfolio analysis. If you need a broker to take care of something uh, for you, Todd can do it. Todd, thank you so much for joining me. How are you doing today? Very good, Jonathan. Thank you. That was quite a intro. I really appreciate all that. <laughs> Well, Todd, I am sincerely looking forward to this conversation, getting a little more information about what you are experiencing on the ground, in the trenches, uh, in, in the office space, in the Cincinnati area. But before we do that, why don't you tell us a little bit more about your background, how you got started in real estate, and what your work looks like today? Well, you, you did a great job, so I don't want to wear us out with my resume, although I'll just give you kind of the quick bookends. I started uh, right out of college selling uh, investment properties as a just a local real estate agent to small time residential investors. Um, got a little corporate work experience and, and worked in Chicago for a little while uh, for a manufacturing firm and then uh, really got really into the commercial space in about 2001 with Duke Realty where I, um, I had a 10 year career as a leasing and development associate, mostly just doing lease transactions, high volume of lease transactions. And, and Duke Realty, which is now Prologis, uh, was one of the biggest REITs and, and the largest office landlord in Cincinnati at the time. So it was a great way to learn the right way to do the business and learn from some of the best in the business. Um, and it was interesting because with a REIT, you don't really use banks. You just use, you, you operate as if you're, it's your own company, really. And um, <clears throat> it's a great way to learn. And then I came over to JLL in 2012. And uh, I can't believe I've been here for coming up on like 13 years. So, uh, and just doing brokerage, which has really opened uh, my world up to, you know, looking at it from the user perspective and, you know, running accounts and uh, the really the buy side or the tenant side of the transaction uh, versus all my experience at Duke had all been landlord and asset related and development related. So it's been a great career. Uh, today, I, I really work mostly on the owner side, the landlord side. Uh, I do have a, a few accounts where I I represent uh, the tenant and or, uh, you know, someone who might own some real estate that needs to dispose of it or needs to come up with an asset plan on strategically how do we manage our portfolio, whether it's leasing, selling, buying. Uh, so it's a it's a great business and it's been a lot of fun so far. Such an interesting and varied background. Um, it sounds like your experience at Duke was really instrumental in the formation of 
kind of your philosophy as a broker. So with all of your experience that you're getting on the ground in the uh, mostly in the office <clears throat> asset class in Cincinnati, I'd like to ask you if you could give us kind of a 10,000 foot view of what are you experiencing in the office space in your market today? Uh, yeah, well, happy to, uh, you know, the, the Cincinnati market, um, the inventory, which we, we track the class A and B office assets in our, in our local market. And it's a 46 million square foot total inventory. Uh, the average direct asking rent on, on a gross basis. So it includes net rents plus full service operating expenses. The average A and B Asking rates are twenty-one dollars um, and seventy-four cents a foot. Um, that's A and B, and then the total vacancy is twenty-one percent. So it, it's not really as bad as as many might think uh, in terms of uh, total vacancy. And actually, the, the rates are not really that low. It's not that you know, with COVID and everything, a lot of people thought maybe the rates would would go way down. What we're finding is, uh, which I think is very interesting, office tenants, if their lease is rolling, and some of them just have the same amount of space they had since COVID, but um, if their lease rolled between now and, and when COVID happened, they that's given them an opportunity to say, you know, maybe we had 50,000 feet at the time. It was spread out. It was dense, densely packed with cubicles and work, you know, traditional office spaces and and they right size it and so what i've found many many times and my partners will say the same thing they might go from let's say fifty thousand feet to thirty five thousand feet but they move up they, they move up an asset class or they improve their space so that the space is now you know kind of a cooler space one that will attract employees and get them to want to come into the space uh come to the office you know, that stat I read in the beginning, 3.08 days a week, that, that's a nice kind of ballpark number that you could apply kind of across the board when you're you're talking about the market. And so employers want to give them a reason to come in three days a week or more. And and when you've got a flexibility like that, maybe it's very light on Mondays and it's very light on Fridays, um, then you don't necessarily have assigned seats all the time. And you've got more open conference rooms and workspaces for people to meet. So it's conceptually, it's it's changed a lot in the last few years. And it's been exciting to watch. I'm curious, that other stat that you just brought out, the 21% vacancy. And in, in your last answer, I think you were leading into uh, into this question a little bit. But what sort of spaces are sitting vacant? And what sort of spaces are getting leased? Do you see any patterns in the spaces that are sitting vacant? Yes, the, the, the spaces, you know, it's, it's just more of a lot of what we already knew. The, the more tired buildings, uh, the, maybe the aging Class B assets, the Class C assets, where the owner is not investing uh, dollars into the space. Maybe it's in a kind of a tired office park that's away from amenities, um, and there's no sign of, of any kind of improvement. You know, there, there's no construction going on in the building. There's no uh, proactive lobby uh, redesign going on. Those, those are the assets that are just going to, that are kind of sitting. And, and frankly, tenants, those, you know, when I talked about that, that right sizing situation earlier, tenants that might maybe are in a 50,000 square foot floor plate in an, in an older asset and ownership is not sprucing it up or doing anything and there aren't any amenities those are the the buildings that are getting left behind um and it's you know it's tough to see but i think it is part of the natural you know the nature of the business and which has always been the case it's just been accelerated uh in this kind of new environment so it sounds like buildings that are uh, more highly amenitized. You had talked earlier about making a cool space, uh, you know, an attractive space that if if employees are only coming in about three days per week, 
Um, it's got to be a place that employees want to come in. And we all know employers want employees in five days a week for the most part, uh, but they can't get five days right now. They can only get 3.08 days right now. So can you talk about some of the amenities that landlords are doing and are willing to do uh, to get spaces leased up and get great tenants in there and get employees in the door and excited about coming to the office? Yeah, great question. Um, you know, some will come as, as no surprise, uh, but an interesting thing, like at Pfeiffer Woods, it's a building in Blue Ash. It's a perfect example, owned by one of our clients, managed by Lincoln Management. Um, it's a, it's a you know, let's say it's a 2001 vintage office building um, that sits close to I-71 here in Blue Ash, but it, you know, it was a little dated, although it was still class A, it was a little dated and had some vacancy. Well, our client came in and proactively took 5,000 feet off the lobby that we were trying to lease, but it had been vacant for quite some time. They went ahead and took that out of the rentable area of the building. So, you know, you're, you're maybe you're tweaking for simple math, you're tweaking the, the total rentable area from a 105,000 square feet, maybe now it's only 100,000 feet or, you know, something in that in that range. So you've shrunk the building a little bit, but what you've done with that 5,000 that was tough to lease is you've turned it into a tenant lounge and a conference room and a boardroom with a little area for like upgraded vending. And then there's a small gym behind it. And so right when I walk into the building with a prospect, we look to the right and rather than a 5,000 square foot vacancy, we walk into this shared lounge, which is really cool and tenants have free access to it. It's like a big break room on steroids uh, with a conference facility, which also has all the new AV equipment and the flat screen TV and you know presentation uh, equipment. So, and you can host parties in there, you can reserve it through management and kind of make it your space for the day if you need to. But if not, it's available at all times for, for tenant access. And then the gym right behind it, again, it's not a huge gym. We've taken 5,000 feet and, and done all this. Uh, and, you know, in the days, in days past, landlords would have not gone for that. They don't want to take rentable area away from their rent roll or their revenue. But you, you need to do this. This is worth, it's worth that shrinking the building a little bit to add that amenity. Uh, and then the gym doesn't have to be anything over the top. What we found is you don't need a, a 10,000 square foot gym or even a, even a 5,000 square foot gym. You need a 2,500 square foot gym that's a little bit bigger than your select service hotel gym that has a couple of bathrooms with showers and you know card reader access. Uh, and you give it for free. Don't, don't try to charge a fee for it. It's not going to pay for itself. It's going to pay for itself when you get a big tenant that pays big rents. And so we've, we've found that that example, and that's, that's an example that's happened time and time again, but it's a perfect example of, of a building that was a little tired, great building, just needed a little shot in the arm. And we've got right now 25,000 square feet of leases out for signature for that that building. So then all of a sudden the vacancy is going to go, you know, it's going to be in the eighties. It's going to be in the mid eighties. So that, that's the proofs in the pudding right there. And, and that's what we're recommending uh, to our clients that, that are having these challenges. I want to stay on this topic. I know you uh, largely represent owners and landlords. So I imagine, imagine a scenario that you mentioned before, maybe it's a, an older office park, maybe it's an older, you know, 80s, 90s era office building with some significant vacancy and an owner that's reluctant to put money into it because, you know, it's a it's a catch 22. There's they don't want to put money into it because there's so much vacancy and there's no income coming in, but there's no income coming in because it's tired and old and there's not much happening there. And so what what suggestions or advice do you have for owners or potential investors with maybe a tired, uh, outdated office building? What are is there any low hanging fruit or any steps that these owners can take to 
revitalize and and bring some life into their building? Yeah, great question, Jonathan. I mean, th- there is always reluctancy. You've got a building; it's a it's a bad, tough office market. You've got an aging asset. Um, if your basis is low and and you don't have, you know, maybe the building's paid for. It's a low basis. You've had it for a long time, and you've had a couple of generations of tenants move out. It, it's now's the time. Uh, if if you want to hang around and try to get value, now's the time to proactively. Get over that reluctance, spend the money on the lobby, take our advice. You know, every building's different. So our team would come in and and we'd recommend maybe we we bring in an architect and a and a design firm. Uh, but at the very least, we would come in and give you our our two cents and, and we'll know then, you know, where do we want to go from here? Um, but it's very strategic. It, it's very we don't just ask our clients or our potential clients just to spend money for fun and, and no one answer is the same for any any landlord or owner. So um, you strategically do it. it. It might be a lobby. It might be, you know, a common lounge or a, 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 a workout facility, or maybe it's exterior updates that you just need to make it prettier as you pull up to the building. Um, so all these things come into play. It depends on the market you're in and, and what the competitive set is in your immediate market. Um, but but you got to get owners to get over that reluctance. Uh, otherwise, you know, sometimes they, they don't want to do it. They don't want to spend the money. And that's OK. So then you come up with a strategy. OK, if we're not going to do that, can we just keep it the way it is? You know, fix the holes, make sure the roof is good and the HVAC works. That's. Those are the basics. And then undercut the market on a rental rate. We just don't see a lot of bargain tenants out there. They're out there still. But the days of, um, you know, finding the cheapest office space and jamming the most people into it uh, for the most dense kind of call center, you know, situation, those days for the most part have gone away. Those tenants still exist, but that's a market that you're not going to catch as many tenants in. So, but that could be a strategy. And, and we have clients that decide to do that. And then we have clients that decide, you know what, I'm getting out of the game. Let's sell this thing. And then, so then you put it on the market and you, you know, you, you do a, a broker opinion of value, which we do, you know, for free. And, um, and we say, look, you know, here's the range. If you're patient, here's a number. You, you got to be a little lucky and be a little patient, find the right end user to make it their new headquarters. They'll buy it maybe at a little bit of a premium or you can sell it tomorrow to an investor uh, that's looking to, to buy low, but you can at least get it off your books uh, if, if that's the, the route you go. And then there's everything in between and it's all about patience and, and taking the time and having the right kind of guardrails on what's the lowest you want to go and, and what do we think that the best number we can get is. And so that's a, that's a disposition strategy that, that also can come into play if you don't want to if you don't want to get in the leasing game or stay in the leasing game anymore. And and just by the way, in this environment, you also have redevelopment. So we've had some some projects here locally um, that where the the tenant or the the investor has purchased an old office building that's an 80s or 90s vintage office building, and believe it or not, converted the building and the site into residential like rental units uh, and townhouses, which is which is amazing. You would have never thought that in years past. And and it's happened. It's happened a couple times here locally, which is exciting to see. And, and I think that's a trend we'll continue to see. Your comments about a tenant, uh, you know, in this market, largely not wanting to, it's essentially a race to the bottom, you know, uh, an employer wanting to jam as many employees into a space as possible and pay as little rent as possible. That doesn't jive with the other patterns that, that we previously talked about with employers wanting to entice employees to get into the office because, you know, employees want to, want to be in a cool trendy space and being jam-packed into a call center uh, that's maybe dingy and outdated doesn't jive with that and so it makes a lot of sense that you're not seeing a lot of tenants choose that route and so um, i know you're 
you largely focus your work with landlords and owners, but I imagine you do uh, have some tenant interactions. And so I'm interested in um, kind of your experience in in what you're experiencing with tenants right now as they as you tour space, as tenants tour space. <clears throat> What are their reactions? What are they wanting when they walk into a space? Um, what are some of their thoughts and their takeaways as they're viewing space? Yeah, yeah, no, no problem. And, and you know, I do represent plenty of tenants. And, and JLL has an amazing um, roster of clients where we're lucky enough locally sometimes to represent some, you know, massive companies where they need the local representation and market knowledge. So we, we do represent global companies that come into town, and those are those are fascinating to see because the head of real estate might be telling you, hey, I was just over in Europe negotiating a deal like in London or something. And here we are in Cincinnati looking to open up our our uh, Kroger sales office, which which those guys need space and and they want it to be really cool. So it's so much fun to hear that global point of view like in real time. And so those tenants are all over the place, you know, they're, but they lead the thought kind of their thought leadership in, um, you know, they want to make their client, uh, you know, happy and want to come, want to come to their space, uh, many times. So like, say it's a consumer packaged goods company, a global consumer packaged goods company, which we have a lot of here in Cincinnati with, with some of the big headquarters that we have that I don't even have to mention. Um, but they'll come to town. They will um, say, OK, we either want to be downtown uh, near our client, head, the client's headquarters, or sometimes they'll say we want to be out in the suburbs. We want to be in Mason or Westchester because we just hired someone to run this office and they live there. And that's where they want it to be. And so that that happens. You know, it's kind of like a 50 50 uh, coin toss for that. But um, to your question it's it's strategic you look at the demographics who are they trying to hire you know is there a certain age uh or type of you know employee that they're going after so that drives it a lot of times you know that the first thing i said where do we want to be just physically from a a high market point of view and then we get into the demographics and then we might come up with two or three submarkets that they find access, uh, acceptable and then they'll rank those and and we really go looking hard for for the space and what's interesting in cincinnati so you know downtown's one thing but then you get you start to go up into the suburbs and say you're in in rookwood which is a really nice high-end uh sub market um kind of that we call it like the midtown market and you're you've got only a select uh group of class a buildings and the the rents are you know over $30 gross per square foot. And, and a lot of these global consumer packaged goods or whatever type of business they're in, they, they don't bat an eye because they just did a deal in London. And so they're like, well, that's okay. And then they have those tenants that I'm speaking of, they've got their specs. They already know what they want the space to look like. So then our job is to find the building, get a space plan done. They might do the space plan themselves and then get as much tenant improvement dollars as we can for the best rate possible. But a lot of times we're focused on getting as many tenant improvement dollars as we can, because that big tenant is going to spend double that. You know, they're going to put their own money into the space. So whatever we can do to bridge that gap is a home run. So that's that's one thing. And that might be too long of an answer, but it's it's interesting because Cincinnati does have a nice dynamic marketplace like that, where you've got these these huge companies coming into town looking for space. And then if it's a local accounting firm, that's a whole different story. They, they might be a profitable, you know, second generation accounting firm that's doing great. They need to update their space too. A lot of times they're in an old class B space that the last generation loved and, and did a couple renewals in. Well, now the new generation's taken over. They're trying to hire, they're trying to attract people to come into the office. So, they're looking a lot of times they're looking for like a turnkey build out. You know, we just need new walls, new paint, new carpet. We're an insurance brokerage. We're a we're an accounting firm. Um, and so you're trying to navigate. OK, let's get the best bang for our buck. 
Let's get the best building that they want to pay for. And then let's have the landlord. Let's see if we can get the landlord to cover all of the improvements or most of them. And so it's a different, um, it's, it's a little bit of a different game. And, and uh, what we found also in this, in this market, uh, there have been so many investors that have kind of broken up the market. There used to be a few big players that own the office buildings here. That's diversified a great deal. So we have a very, very diverse ownership uh, structure and kind of situation uh, in our market today, which I think is is lent well from the tenant side. So it's it's been it's been good for the tenant to be able to to navigate and negotiate that uh, on their behalf. You alluded to the fact that tenants have some leverage right now. And so I'm interested in any patterns that you're seeing in terms of leases. Um, I know not too long ago, there was a pattern we were seeing where tenants were wanting shorter leases and they were willing to pay higher premiums for sh for shorter leases. Um, so I'm interested in lease length and terms, but then also concessions. Um, so landlords can be prepared for, you know, what what is going to be asked of them when a tenant wants their space. Yeah. So the buildings that are the winner, you know, there's always winners and losers. The buildings that are doing all the things that we're talking about and you know, they're putting money into the building. Uh, they've got the coolest location where people want to be. Um, those those landlords are not, it, it's not what you might think. They're not going over the top with, you know, doing deals like that almost don't make sense, which we've seen that in past markets. But in today's market, the top, the top landlords with the best buildings, the trophy assets, they're just doing deals. And people a lot of times are, kind of fighting to get into those buildings. So that's that's a surprise and that's good. So then the step down, um, the landlords that are maybe an A minus or they're a step down from the very top of the market, they're, they're fighting because it's more, they've got more competition and, and they're throwing incentives around. Um, and so we're seeing that, you know, the tenants, if they decide to go somewhere and say, say it's a, you know, a middle of the range, 22 gross suburban office building, 23 gross, uh, they'll just negotiate the best they can. And those are still seven to 10 year deals uh, for a full, if I'm relocating my company then, or I'm coming into town, uh, you know, it's traditionally five, seven or 10 is a new, is a new deal, new lease deal. The really, really big ones are seven to 10. Um, but then there's, there are plenty of five-year deals too, because a lot of them are saying, you know, I'm not sure what the future holds with office space. So, or maybe I'm on a, I just heard this morning on a, on a call with a client, um, we're buying other companies. We might be 20,000 feet today, but I have no idea what we're going to be in three to five years. So that CFO is thinking, you know, for me to do a five or even a seven, I'm, I'm starting to get a little uncomfortable uh, because I don't know what we're going to look like down the road. So it's an interesting, you know, that's not really anything new, but um, but it is good to see that that many of the big tenants are making big commitments uh, to get those big tenant improvement dollars because you get the most money for the longer term. Like the banks aren't going to give you $50 a foot if you're only going to do a five-year lease. If you're going to do a 10-year lease, the lender will get on board with $50 a foot, which is a good number for a new move into a class A building. Sometimes you, you, you get higher than that. So I don't know if that answers the question, but yeah, yeah, it does. And, you know, like most things, I think I think the answer is it depends. And um, it sounds like, you know, the the buildings in the great locations, the class A type product, um, the landlords know what they have and, and they know that there are going to be tenants out there for that great product. And and they're willing to provide some concessions for a great tenant, but maybe not willing to bend over backwards, because if if this tenant doesn't take it, then there's going to be someone else that that comes along. Um, and I'll just say, you know, it's a lot of landlords, they they might have bought a building, they're not from this market, they, they bought the building whenever five years ago, maybe it's before COVID, maybe not. And they're nervous, because COVID hit. And then it's like, 
if there's a tenant out there, a lot of times they might overplay their hand. And, and, and we find ourselves, well, you know, we don't think you need to get that aggressive. We think you're the number one choice here based on what we know about them in the marketplace and who, who else they're looking at. And so we, we try to get them, which is, believe it or not, you know, you wouldn't think that, but we'll say, hey, let's slow this down. Let's not go too hard at this deal because I, I think it's ours to lose. Now, you got to be cautious. You don't want to be too confident and then lose the deal. That's the last thing you want to do. But you can kind of keep your powder dry, call their bluff a couple of times, and, and still win the deal and, you know, not do some upside down bad lease deal just to fill space. So, it, but that, that's all part of having a good leasing team, you know, and, and good market knowledge. And uh, that's important. Todd, as we get to the tail end of our conversation, um, you are clearly somebody with a lot of intel and insight into your local uh, office market. And so I'm interested if you have any thoughts uh, based on, uh, you know, the future of where office is headed, um, just based on what you're seeing, what you're hearing, what you're seeing in the marketplace. Do you have any thoughts on where the future of office is headed? Well, um, the future of office, I mean, I think it's going to be more of, of kind of what we're already talking about. Um, mixed use, you know, um, having residential kind of infiltrate some of these old office uh, suburban. And I keep talking about suburban, obviously, downtown CBDs like Cincinnati, you've already had residential conversions all over the place. They're everywhere, everywhere you look. Um whether it's an old office building or an old hotel that gets converted into residential, that's, that's happening. And that's been fun to watch. Uh, so the suburbs now all of a sudden are because there's a, I'll call it a housing shortage. Um, developers are, are building new residential uh, and they're converting office buildings and office sites into residential. And what, what that's doing uh, it's kind of marrying these two marketplaces together and bringing in retail. So you've got a traditional office uh, project in say it's 500,000 feet in the suburbs. It could be in St. Louis, it could be in Cincinnati or Indianapolis or Columbus or it, really anywhere. And that's never gonna be the same. So you take that piece of ground, however many acres it is, you buy it, maybe you keep one office building or two out of say four, Maybe you convert one of them to residential or sell it to an end user that could be a school. It could be a, a company that just wants to control their own building. And then what you could do, and this is interesting. I'm sorry, I'm going down a little bit of a rabbit hole. You've got all this parking, okay, where the back in the old days, like we've said, it was give me as cheap a space as you can find me with as dense of a footprint as you can find me, which means high parking ratios. The, the high parking ratios are kind of, they're in, they might be in the RFP process, but they're down the list now where they used to be up towards the top. Now it's like, well, my people might work three or four days a week. I'm okay with four per thousand or maybe three per thousand where they used to try to negotiate for six or eight per thousand. So you've got extra real estate now. And so I'm, I'm predicting that um, some of these big office parks will turn into mixed use projects uh, similar to like, you know, some of our clients like, uh, you know, Daimler uh, has their office building up in Liberty Center, which they just sold to real life. So locally, we've got Liberty Center, which is a ground up mixed use development. You've got uh, Newport on the levee, which is an old Steiner development that North American properties purchased. That's mixed use. It's right next door to a a, a great apartment community. So the amenitizing of the office market uh, is the future. And, and, and I, I think we're going to see more and more opportunistic developers come in that, that aren't, you know, that these are people that are, you know, have already done it. Maybe it's, or maybe it's the first time they do it and they bring in partners, but I'm going to, I'm going to predict that's kind of going to be the trend moving forward in a lot of markets like Cincinnati. And it's yeah. going to be good for the office market. 
Really interesting stuff, Todd. I've really enjoyed this conversation and just really appreciate all of your expertise and your deep uh, level of knowledge in the market. Uh, before we wrap up, was there anything that we didn't talk about today regarding the office market uh, or about your work that you want to make sure that we hit on? No, not really. We just really enjoy uh, enjoy it. You know, we've done it for a long time. We've got a team uh, of five people here and uh, we all kind of complement each other. So it, it's fun whether whether you're looking for space or you want to, you know, just talk about how do I reposition my asset or maybe maybe a client's thinking about buying a building in our market. We're always happy to, to talk to end users and uh, owners and investors of all types uh, about the market because it's actually fun for us. <laughs> Believe it or not, we, we like doing it. So um, I appreciate your time and um, uh, hopefully we we made some sense today. Yeah, absolutely. And Todd, I know uh, you work closely with Michelle Klingenberg. She was a guest on the show a few months ago, and um, you know she was uh, very, very impressive. And you were, uh, you are obviously as well. And so, um, I've no doubt that if listeners have any uh, needs for uh, for leasing or purchasing office space in Cincinnati, Dayton, or Northern Kentucky. Um, that the JLL team is definitely a formidable option and would be a great asset to any uh, investor or user real estate team. Um, Todd, if listeners want to connect with you and your team, learn more about you, where would you like to send people? Yeah, sure. Uh, LinkedIn is probably the easiest. Todd Pease, T-O-D-D-P-E-A-S-E at LinkedIn. And then you can always email me as well, todd.pease at jll.com. Todd, this has been an awesome conversation. Thank you so much for joining me. Absolutely. Thank you, Jonathan. Have a good L day. Listeners, if you enjoyed this conversation, feel free to reach out to either one of us. We clearly love talking about commercial real estate, and we would love to connect with you. Thank you so much for listening. Come back next week for another great interview. Until next time. Thanks, Jonathan.